On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Mia. And Mia was in a psychologically abusive relationship with a triangulating abuser. It's a story of rule following, infidelity, mocking, parental alienation, primary supply, threats, grief, and healing. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and thanks for tuning in to this episode. And today with us, we have Mia. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here with us. And if you want to be a guest like Mia is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. Please do read all of the instructions and then either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or just fill out our guest form, press the submit button. Please send it in the format that we ask for, and we can never have enough stories. So please do send in your stories today. And today we are going to hear Mia's story. And a big thank you to Mia for being here. Uh, Her story is one that starts off as a teenager and it escalates. And it's really difficult to tell what type of person you might be dealing with when you're a teenager because their behaviors are going to unfold for the first time as your relationship goes on. So it's very difficult to tell and it's all going to be done in a covert way. Uh, manner at that point. So a really big uh, thank you to uh, Mia and some trigger warnings on this episode. There are uh, physical threats that you'll hear uh, in this episode. And there is mention uh, as well about uh, childhood, uh, child physical abuse. It wasn't to Mia, but it was to her daughter, just a brief mention of it. So those are the trigger warnings for this episode. So with that being said, and that out of the way, Without further ado, now everyone, Mia, the floor is now yours. Yeah, so I think if I were to start really at the very beginning, I would say that I grew up in um, an old-fashioned family system. We all went to Catholic school. We learned to be rule followers, and we had the kindest parents in the world. So my mom and dad um, are 61 years married now, married now. They met when they were 18 and 19. They had four children. And I have to say that all four of us really grew up in this world where, um, you know, you didn't disappoint mom and dad. You followed the rules. And I'm not suggesting that all of us followed the rules, but I really tended to be a rule follower. I was very much wanting to please mom and dad. And so I um, grew up in that family system. It was really important that we didn't have um, boyfriends at a young age. Um, When we were younger, my mom was pretty old fashioned about that. Um, The boys were allowed to have girlfriends. So it was kind of the typical, you know, different gender uh, treatment in our family. But they really just talked all the time about being kind to people, being forgiving, always giving people the benefit of the doubt. It was really the way that we were taught to be. And even when, um, you know, maybe the neighborhood lady would come over and my mom hadn't invited her, my mom would be gracious and and allow her in. So boundaries were not really something that we were purposefully taught. And I'm not suggesting we weren't taught them, but we weren't purposefully taught them. And so um, so we grew up in this world where it was just really important to make sure everybody was happy. And as far as your views on the world um, and the outside world, were you sheltered from that world? Um, and, and what was like your neighborhood like? What was like the feel 
what was high school like as far as a lot of friends? Were you an achiever in high school? Yeah, so I would say we lived in an, a great uh, middle class neighborhood. Everybody played kickball late at night in the middle of the street back in the day when people used to play outside a lot more. And um, everybody in the neighborhood went to one of four or five churches every single Sunday. The neighborhood would be empty. Everybody would be with their families at church. Um, the big thing was to go to the local drive-in and watch a movie on the roof of your big old long station wagon. <laughs> so, um, but we did go to 12 years of Catholic schooling. So that meant, you know, repentance and confession and all of these things. And in high school, I would say that I was part of the, um, I was more of the quieter group. Um, I wasn't part of the popular group and because I wasn't allowed to go out like everyone else was. I lived a very, I would say, back to your question, Brandon, it was a sheltered life, I would say. Um, I have a sister-in-law who's Portuguese, and we like to joke that I that I grew up in a cave and she grew up on an island, on a cave and an island, you know, so just a little bit more uh, stringent. And um, so it was, it was, but it was beautiful. We all got along. We had a wonderful family system. And we always, I think my parents had one argument that we can all recollect. And we all remember that argument. But my father treated my mother like gold. And she adored him to pieces. I've never heard my parents call each other by their first names. Their names were always honey. That's what they called each other. So, I mean, in some ways, I feel like it was pretty idyllic. And it certainly... There were problems, you know, and there were certainly I had a couple of siblings who were a little more rebellious and that would certainly cause problems. But I did not want to be rebellious. I was not going to be rebellious. Uh, do you have any other things as far as like do you have healthy self-esteem at this point, you know, before you hit 18, things along those lines, any issues with that? Yeah, I would say that I think over I was successful in high school. I had a group of friends. Um, of course, I wished I was part of the popular crowd. I um, I was the kid who had a paper route. <laughs> I didn't participate in school sports. And even though I probably could have and should have, but, you know, there was an obligation to contribute also to the family. Like my parents had four kids in Catholic school. So we all kind of worked little part-time jobs. So the socialization part, I would say, was pretty narrow. And that I believe that narrowness led me to, you know, the first guy who liked me for me to want to be part of that relationship. And, and truly, my ex-partner was really my first ever boyfriend. And I think that it felt so good to have a guy interested in me and like me and want to go out with me and tell me such wonderful things. So self-worth, I think, is such a a nuanced thing because you could have good self-worth, right? Like at school or with certain friends, but then maybe not the best when it comes to relationships. And, you know, there was always this, you know, you shouldn't date, you shouldn't be out with boys. No, you can't go to that party, you know, that everybody else is going to in eighth grade or 10th grade. And so when this guy was interested, it was perfect opportunity for me to kind of have those experiences that I had wanted to have. And did you have uh, career aspirations when you were younger that you um, were like, I'm going to go do this and I'm going to take like the world by its horns? Uh, so not, not, I never expected to do what I do. <laughs> um, I always wanted to be a teacher and I was very excited about being an educator, but I could have never uh, seen my world going this way. Although at the age of 19, I did begin this work in domestic abuse and sexual assault. I began, uh, I was a domestic, I became a certified domestic abuse, sexual assault crisis counselor because someone really close to me had suffered sexual abuse as a child. And that became a passion for me. I wanted to be an educator, but I also wanted to help people. And as a matter of fact, spoke on city hall at the age of, I think 20 on, um, uh, against child pornography. So I think when we talk about self-worth, I had a a lot of really stable sense of self and, you know, was proud to be able to speak on this really important topic on behalf of the agency at the time, yet still became entangled in an abusive relationship. So after, you know, you, you, you're a young adult, eventually you meet this person that this story is about. So take us from there. 
Yeah, so I met him when I was 16. I was uh, running by his house and I met him when I was 16. So, um, and he was immediately in love with me. Um, he actually told his mother when he saw me running by, he told me after we met, he told his mother that he, um, I'm going to marry that girl is what he said. And, uh, at, at, and he was 15 and he said that. So it was really, when I look back now, never knew the words love bombing and all of that. But when I look back now, it was a wonderful, lovely romance. The thing was, is I had a curfew at 10 at the time and I had to go home and he used to go out after. And, you know, I look back now and I'm like, hmm, what was he doing when he went out after, <laughs> right? So, um, so we had a great relationship. We, we, and we dated for seven years. I went to college. He, um, I broke up with him once during college because there was a gentleman, uh, a boy at college who liked me and I, I didn't want to cheat on him. So I said, I want to break up. He was devastated. He was going to, he threatened suicide. He was, you know, how could you do this to me? And, um, and I did go out with that boy, um, and it didn't feel right. And so then I went right back to him. Of course, he was waiting for me. He was devastated, right? And so so I would say that I thought we were very much in love and it was it was wonderful. I mean, I think when I look back now, there were so many remarkable things. There were times, again, that he would drop me off at home, but then I knew he went out with his friends. And, you know, what was he doing? There was the night of, you know, I mean, people may snicker, but there was the night of his stag where my father gave him his stag because he didn't have his dad involved in his life. And, and my brothers gave, and he never, he never came home from the stag. And, you know, this is a week before we were getting married. And, um, and then there was this like inability to show me love, like in front of other people. It's, 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 it, he, he was proud of me, I think, but he couldn't like exude like pride. He couldn't say, oh, you know, she just got her bachelor's degree in education and maybe talk about some of the great things I accomplished in my bachelor's degree. It it was never an over expression of, um, of pride. And what I, I look back now and I realize he never really expressed pride in me. I never got my self-worth fed through him. That just never happened in this relationship. The only thing that was fed by him is this love and adoration. You know, you're the most important woman in my life. You're the most beautiful woman in my life. Um, I could never love anyone more than you. I'm so lucky to have you. Those types of things. But there was never a, wow, you just wrote that paper and so-and-so really liked it. There was never that. You know, we get a lot of stories on our show from, from, from people when they meet their partner when they're young. And it's so hard to discern sometimes, well, what's immature behavior? You know, what will carry on in life? Will this person change? Um, and there's a lot of excuses that can happen here at between 16 and, and 23 for you. Um, so kind of going back and, and looking at everything and for people that have gone through these situations when it's that young, I mean, what's the biggest thing that you were, would look for um, to kind of discern from what is uh, a real telltale sign here that this person's going to end up um, getting worse over time? And I guess uh, maybe also... Tell us about his family. Maybe that might be a big uh, eye opener for everyone, and like, yeah. and how that family system works. Uh, yeah. I guess. Right. So now, in my in my present work, I really research and talk about these issues. But I would say that um, in his family system, he grew up with a um, when the mom and dad divorced, the mom told the children that their father um, wanted nothing to do with them. And anytime the dad would call, the mom would say, here's the, and she, the bleep is on the phone for you is what she would say. So the children learned that they couldn't love their father, even if they wanted to. 
And there were many, many experiences of what I would call psychological abuse, where he would come and bring presents and put them on the porch at Christmas time because he wasn't allowed to see them. This was during the 1970s. And she would take the bag and throw it in the garbage. Um, when they divorced the family um, boat, she he got the family boat, she got the house when they divorced. And um, the day of the divorce, she took an ax to the family boat in front of the children. The children remember that. So there is a lot of vengeful hate. When we talk about personality, characterological issues, it's pretty apparent to me now and certainly in the last 15 or so years. I mean, I knew there was something not right, but really an understanding of that she was abusive and that 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 childhood trauma is that he wasn't able to feel unconditional love from his mom and certainly had didn't, his dad left his dad fled he went to california and fled the east coast so the idea that his dad um you know fled because he was so he couldn't handle it anymore you know and and i'm sure his dad had some of his own issues too perhaps you know substance use or something like that but that's no excuse for being so harmful right and so um, when I look back, I knew that and I felt bad for that, that I was like, my heart was like, oh my gosh, this poor person, I was only 16 or 18, whenever it was, I never thought that that, and I actually always thought that out of all of his siblings, he seemed to have the best handle on those experiences. He seemed to understand it the best. And I mean, he works in a school as a school counselor. He went to school counseling. He went for a master's in counseling. So... I just assumed, but I think what you're pointing to is that there's some people who are really overt in their behaviors. He was really covert. He was so covert for so, so long. Yeah. So eventually the stag happens. He uh, doesn't come home that night, but you do end up getting married. I do. So, so you get married and are things good for a while? Yeah. So we get married and um, I mean, he's crying during our vows. I mean, this man loves me so much. I mean, he's sobbing as he's saying his vows at the wedding. Um, and then we um, we are married. We get our first house. I'm working two jobs, which I always kind of did, whether it was a job and a job and a half, because he decides to go back to school for a different degree. And um, he's working part-time and going to school. So I'm supporting for the most part. And um, and then we get to do some really great traveling and have a great time traveling. But there are times where he goes out with a friend and he doesn't come home till two or three in the morning. And you know, this is before cell phones. This is before any of that. So, you know, I would just be waiting up and maybe crying and upset. Where were you? What happened? Oh, I got a flat tire. There was always a reasonable excuse. There was always a reasonable excuse. Then there was the stash of porn, you know, that I found. Um, and um, I actually, you know, so I'm embarrassed to say, but I found um, like a porn, like porn of like basically voyeurism of the neighbor next door in her bathing suit. And it was a young person. And I, I, I just, I just didn't know what to do with it. I just was like, how wrong is this? How bad is this? Like, should I be upset? I was upset, but of course he convinced me that it was just, you know, he had the video camera out and it just turned a certain way. And he had all the reasonable excuses that I went along with. And I think, like, I mean, I feel a little shame, like that I didn't like run for the hills then, you know what I mean? I ha didn't have any children yet. And um, yeah, so then we decided to start a family. And um, I have to say that I think for me, that began, that was the pregnancies. And that experience is when I started to really have inclinations besides, so he promised me he was never going to like, those were old videos. He wasn't, didn't watch porn anymore. And, you know, that was just a mistake with that. He, he convinced me. Right. And so then, you know, but when I was pregnant, he was not attentive. He was not at all concerned about my well-being or me doing too much unless other people were around. 
And then when I had our son, this is the most, this is like the experience of gaslighting that could occur. So this is about eight years after we're married and I had my son and the moment I gave birth and it was a difficult delivery, you know, as many deliveries can be, he was holding my son and he was sobbing for 30 minutes holding my son, not once acknowledging me, not once like, I don't know. I I don't know, maybe people get thank yous. I don't know what women get when they give birth, but but like there was no acknowledgement of me. I had disappeared in the room and, um, and the doctors were still, you know, working on me, fixing me, you know, getting me, um, you know, post delivery. And, um, and he was sobbing. And I remember saying to the nurse, he didn't have his father in his life. And this having a son really matters so much to him. I remember being empathetic about where he was coming from, but also being hurt and, 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 and questioning it. And then as time went on, our first child was so easy, the easiest baby in the world. So, I mean, would get up in the middle of the night to nurse and all of that, but I was in charge of all feedings and, but he was an easy baby. And as time went on, I realized that I went from being elevated, this, this amazing, you know, you're the perfect wife. I'm so lucky to have you to being replaced. I was replaced by my son and I didn't have an ounce of jealousy about that. I just missed the relationship I thought I had with this man. But I think what is interesting is that I would say to people, he won't go on dates anymore with me. He doesn't want to leave our son or, and you know, you have to nurture relationships if you want them to be healthy. You know, he won't, we we never stay up together and watch a movie together anymore. You know, he doesn't want to spend time with me, but people would see him with my son and he was, he would get an award for best dad. And so people in some ways gaslit me, like you're so lucky He's so great with your son. He he gives your son baths. He takes care of your son. Look at him, how wonderful he is. And I felt guilty for feeling anyway that I was not at all part of his life anymore. So I basically, what happened was I went from being the primary, like I think, supply in his life to being not anymore. And my, my son became that. And... Did you address when you address these concerns? How were they met? Yeah, no, you're you know you're jealous, right? So I I learned very quickly to not even address it. I learned to just stop even being worried about it because the couple of times I did postpartum, um, I was told I was um, jealous. And, and it was like, no, I just miss you. I just want time with you too. And we need us. And then when my daughter came, she was a colicky baby. She was a little more difficult and he was literally not involved at all in her care. And, um, and, and then, and I was so exhausted and so tired and I needed help. I had a, uh, they were 20 months apart. So they were super close in age and I needed help. And he was just would go upstairs and go to bed and leave me with the kids. Um, so when I say he was very much engaged, like my son, when, when he wasn't tired, he was happy to play with my son. But if it was, if he was tired, then he had, then he had performed his duties and then he would go to bed. And, um, so, and so as my daughter came out of colickiness and just became adoring of dad, everything changed. You know what I mean? So my son, who tends to be a little more reserved and quiet and much, very much a thinker, not as outward, out, outgoing, um, you know, he would just be playing with toys and like to read a lot. And my daughter loved jumping on daddy and getting piggyback rides. And not that my son didn't, but she was very much became daddy's little girl. And it was beautiful to watch. It was really, really beautiful to watch. And um, so I would say that that period of time from her about two till about age nine, um, that seemed like a relatively okay period of time in our life. Um, there were some ups and downs. There were some things that happened that um, were difficult. I remember him making fun of how I cooked. Um, and one time him throwing a plate, like saying, this is disgusting. I'm not eating it in front of my children. Um, 
And then eventually he took over cooking so um, because he cooked better and that was fine. And I did the cleaning and I thought that that worked out pretty good. That was a pretty equal way of, you know, handling that. But there were like all of these little like, oh, mom thinks she's funny. His, his favorite sense of humor or form of humor is mockery. And he would use mockery a lot. And then when he would use it, even during this time, I said when things were kind of okay, um, that he would use it and then say I was sensitive if I felt offended by it. I also would say that one of the things that I, when I look back now, I realize he wouldn't let me join a gym. I wanted to belong to a gym. I couldn't do yoga. Um, I, you know, most people my age were probably getting their nails manicured. I couldn't get my nails manicured because it costs too much. And how could you spend money on this when I take the time to fix our cars ourselves, myself? So he always loved to fix our cars. So he would use that as a, I fix the cars. There's no way that you can go and get your nails done. So there were ways that he was controlling me that I didn't even realize. And now reminding again, that I always worked at least one full-time job and one part-time job throughout the entire marriage. And I could never get him to commit to a budget. I could not like get him to just say, okay, this is how much we'll put into the mutual account. This is how much we'll put into the kids account. So I was putting all the money into the kids account. I was saving for vacation. And so the, the burden of finances was on my back for sure. And I think that what became pretty apparent to me now when I look back is that, I mean, I couldn't just like say I was going to go get my hair done at the hairdresser. Like those were things that I was told I was wrong for even wanting them. And so um, that's an, that's a constraint of my world, right? Like I, I didn't have the freedom to just do that. Never would have thought of it that way while I was living in it at all. But then at around the age of nine, my um, we had a good friend who happened to be my children's music and theater teacher. They loved her and he had an affair with her. And I caught him. And this is another example, though. I caught him. Um, it was when people used to do email. I have no idea. I like was able to get on his computer and figured out what his passcode is. And he was out playing music with her. And I called him where he was. It was local. And I called him and he said, I can't come home now. I have a commitment here. And that was another moment. Like, I just caught you cheating on me with the person you're with. <laughs> And you're not going to come home and just say, hey, I got to go. And by the way, the reason why I was home is because I had Lyme. Like I had, I was sick and he still, like I told him to go. This is the kinds of things that we do, right? We're like, oh, just go. It's fine. I'm okay. I don't need your help. I'm all right. So, um, so when I caught him having that affair, you know, I went to my mom and dad's, uh, I asked him to leave. He wouldn't leave. And... Um, finally, I got him to get out of the house for a couple of days and I looked at our phone bill and I saw all of these phone, I saw this phone number multiple, multiple times. And I thought, oh, he's having two affairs. He's not just having one, he's having two. And I called the number and it was a coworker of her, of his who had just lost her son. And he was, she said, how dare you call me? your husband is my friend and he's been counseling me after the death of my son. So you could imagine how horrible I felt, right? Well, don't you think he made sure that I felt really horrible about that the rest of our marriage, right? So from that moment on, this woman never, I was told I was never invited to any family, any of their events. He was good friends with them. They had a scholarship committee in honor of her son. My children would go to the, the fundraiser. I wasn't allowed to go because she didn't like me. Fast forward to just two months ago, I saw her out and she came up to me and she told me, I know everything. She said, um, I know that he was an abuser and she called him a monster because she said he used my son's death to gain attention um, at our work. So. So here is a moment where you've caught him. Mm -hmm. He's having an affair. Then there's this other situation going on with this woman. He's able to reverse everything around on you. Yeah. Now you are feeling guilty. And even though you've caught him in the act, 
it gets blown over here. The relationship resumes and you're the bad person in this situation. And he's gotten off scot-free. So at this moment of time, you know, you said you went to your parents' home to, you know, be with them. Are you looking at your life and then looking at your parents' marriage at this point and saying, how do these two not look the same? And if you are saying that to yourself, what are you saying to yourself um, and how are you rationalizing things? How are you coping? Like what's going on like in, inside of you? Like there's a fight going on. Um, so what is it? Yeah, I think the fight is really about just wanting to keep my family together. That's really, I mean, my children loved their dad, the dad they thought they had. I mean, you know, they were objects for him. There's no question in my mind. You know, they served him in a really great capacity. Um, But yeah, I just wanted to keep my family together. And they were devastated after this, um, you know, when, when we just separated for a couple of days, they were devastated. So I really just felt like I, and he said, we're going to go to counseling. We're going to go to therapy and course, you know, we never really went consistently and he never really committed to it. So I started going, thank God I started going because that year, really what transpired from that year to the next year is that I continued to see him looking at this other woman at the school. So remember, she's involved in my children's lives. We're no longer friends with her, but I continued to see him Even though he said nothing ever happened, you know, they were just having an emotional affair. I saw all of their emails online. It was very lewd, let's say. Um, But I started to not like him. That's what started to happen. And so I started to not really have the same love for him. And he started to realize it. And so I think that that, even though I didn't even leave him for another eight years from the affair, I think that that was the impetus for me to begin to see things clearly. And we had an event that happened about a year later where we had to go to a school activity and I went with friends in a different car because I was angry with him because I knew this woman was going to be there and I was anticipating what was going to happen. And I, of course, I'm crazy. It's all in my head. You're, you know, you're the crazy. You can't give up. You can't let it go. It's all you. Look at you. You're ruining everything. And when I got home that night, um, it was a BYOB event. When I got home that night, he was already home and he locked me out of the house. And I had no way to get into my house. We never locked our doors ever. And so um, I called the police. This is now we have cell phones. I called the police because I just needed to get into the house. And I didn't want to wake my parents. It was like one in the morning. I had sat in the car with a girlfriend and talked about all of this that was bothering me. Finally, let it all out. And he, um, I call the police, the police come. I don't say it's a domestic abuse or that I'm locked out. I just say, I don't have the keys. Can you, I, I, my husband's not answering the door. I'm just a little concerned. My children weren't home. My children were at a friend's house at a sleepover because we had this event. He answers the door. I believe he was drunk. I don't really know, but he told the officer that I was drunk. He told the officer that I had open bottles in my car. He told my the officer that I was taking all kinds of medication and pills and that I probably was mixing things. Now, the officer did a sobriety test on me. I was sober. There was nothing, you know, that he like looked at me like this is weird. He said, I think you should just probably sleep someplace else tonight. And so he took me to my, met my, I called my father at one in the morning and my father met us halfway and the officer took me to meet my dad. And the next day I went and got my children and went to my parents' house and my ex started telling me, I'm going to have you arrested for kidnapping the children. I'm getting the police to your house right away. You're crazy. You're all of these things. And then intermittently, I love you so much. Just come home. We're soulmates. Like 
like intermittently. It was, it was, it was insane. And I remember sitting with my son and explaining to him how there's some things that dad is saying that don't make any sense. He's saying that he loves me, but he's also saying like there's some time. And I explained to my son what happened to my ex during his childhood. So I had a moment of clarity there, but then he begged me to come back and he said, we'd go to therapy. And then we started about six or so years of me going to therapy, him hardly ever showing up, him saying things like, um, you didn't tell me about the appointment, or um, I don't like that therapist. He threatened two therapists. There, One therapist told me that it's domestic abuse, and he saw it in my text, and he threatened her license. The other therapist, he said that he was going to report her to the board. Um, and so this is just the way that it went for quite a few years of me thinking if I get therapy, maybe we'll get healthier. And I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression. And the reality is nobody said he was an abuser. And that's exactly what he was doing, um, was abusing me over and over again. So So you are patient zero for him in a way. You are getting the first hand view of the evolution of his behaviors and one by one of him figuring out how to get out of things, figuring out responses, figuring out everything. And I think the, you know, the biggest thing you really said there was as far as what type of personality he is, as soon as he felt that you didn't love him the way he wanted to be loved, things really did change. And I really think that's important to hear because um, I don't know if we've mentioned that a lot, uh, really ever on the show in, in that sense of he was good with everything. Things were kind of good. Um as long as you had him on that pedestal. As long as I was a soldier in line doing exactly what he needed me to do. But once that was gone, then the real person showed up. You've been dealing with um, someone who's needs this love, 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 love. It needs all to be on him, all to be on him. And it didn't matter that he stopped doing that for you. As long as you were trying to win him or, you know, be there for the family and the family's all this and thing. But once that happened, then you saw the next level that he could go to. And these are the things that you knew of because things are going on behind the scenes that you don't even know of. Exactly. Exactly. I would say that during that period of time of basically the affair, the first affair, of course, not the only affair, the first affair I found out about and the time that I left him, there is so much that happened in those eight years that I, he knew that I wasn't as in love with him. He knew that something was different and he hated it. But I also remember was contributing financially to the home at a much greater level, and he wasn't held accountable for his funds. And so it wasn't until after the divorce that I calculated how much he had stolen from our family over just a five-year period when I began to notice it, and it was over $100,000. So if that's not a lot of money to a lot of people. That's a lot of money, you know, in, in my world, right? So, so, so there's that. Really what's important here to mention, Brandon, and I, I talk about this in some of my own, you know, educational forums, is that he knew that the kids meant more to me than anything else. And I was the one who drove them to their any practices, games, et cetera. There was a period of time he went to my son's baseball games, but my son was really good at baseball. And I personally feel that that's why. But my daughter did all of these events. We went out, to, I took Tang Soo Do with my kids. I did everything with them. He was never there at all of these events. He was always busy. We had built our second home and he was busy with house projects. And so you know, the end result is I end up finding out that he has another, a whole nother life when I end up leaving him. And he had time for it because he wasn't busy with me and the kids all of the time. 
And so um, we could not go to restaurants and spend money. But then yet I found out later that he was going to restaurants all the time and spending money. Um, But the worst part is that when the affair happened at age nine, at 17 years old, there was an incident between my daughter and him. And she told me that she remembers the day that he, I said, when did all of this start? And um, he was arrested for hurting her. And the day I said, when did this start? How did this happen? And she said, oh, remember when you left, we left and went to Nana and Papa's that weekend? Um, You and dad had that big fight. I was in third grade. And I said, yeah. She goes, yeah. He started telling me that day, you you came home. You said you were going to come home. You guys said you were going to, dad, you and dad told us you were going to get therapy and that you were going to get healthy. And then you went to work, mom. You had to teach that night. And when you went to work, dad told us that you're crazy, that you can't be trusted, that you have depression and anxiety, and that you cheated on him. I, Brandon, I had no idea till my daughter was 17 years old. He had been doing this for eight years. And let me just tell you, you know how these abusers try to align children with them, right? Well, he had... My son, not so much, but he had my daughter convinced that I was her arch nemesis. I I couldn't understand why her adolescence was so difficult. I mean, it was difficult. Well, what I know now is that he was telling her constantly things. We'd be going on a date that we hadn't had in a long time, or maybe finally I got him to go out with friends and I got dressed up and he would whisper to her, she thinks she's prettier than you. He would tell that to his 14-year-old daughter. She thinks she's better than you. He told his, my daughter, your brother thinks he's smarter than you. He told my son, your sister thinks that, um, that you're, you're pretentious, that you're a snob. Now, he's very shy and he could come off as pretentious and that's his biggest fear is he thinks people might think he's not empathic and kind. So he took their vulnerabilities and used it against them and used it against me. So I couldn't figure out what was going on with my daughter. I was going to therapy for that. I He was counter-parenting all of the time in the home. I would say, hey, guys, it's time to clean up the dinner dishes. My son, who will follow her very much like me, would maybe do a few dishes or certainly help. But my daughter would go right into the living room with her dad and sit down and relax. And at that point, it didn't matter who cooked. It was all about... He got to do what he wanted to do. He he had a false narrative set up. And there's no way that anybody could say, like, um, I think somebody once said to me, well, he wasn't always that bad. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. He's always been this bad. He just was covert about it. And even I didn't see the signs. And until I started to pull away, he couldn't handle it. And when I started to pull away, he started to expose himself more and more anything to keep me in line or to keep the children in line so that if I left him, he could harm me the worst. That's a lot that's going on. And you don't even know it's even going on. They don't even know it's going on. No. Excluding your husband during this time in this last, let's say, four years or or five years before everything ends. What's the, like, what is the relationship between all three of you? Are they able to, are your kids able to be friends with each other? Are you segregated? Are you afraid to even talk to each other? Because you're supposed to be a family, but this person is quietly splitting everyone apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, definitely a psychological abuse that is unacknowledged, right? I mean, so detrimental, causes more complex post-traumatic stress than actually physical violence, even though that's horrifying. But because you can't see it, you can't name it. It's insidious. These children, they're developing brains. I mean, they are just so, I mean, it's just so heartbreaking what they go through. Um, So I would say that No, I mean, there were good times, as long as everything was going good, right? So that means, I mean, honestly, Brendan, I mowed the lawn. 
I took care of the whole inside of the house. I wasn't allowed to have any housekeeper, even though I was working extra, extra hours. And he took care of the cars and maybe sometimes was putting up woodwork if we needed to do. In other words, everything was on my shoulders. As long as I did everything, the grocery shopping, everything, taking the kids to all of their events, which of course I love doing. Everything was fine. Um, but I'll tell you, I learned that I couldn't listen to my music in the house because my music was made fun of, whatever it was. I learned that I couldn't complain about his music if I didn't like a particular album or something like that. I learned very quickly that like, I couldn't dance. I remember one time like dancing and, and I was made fun of. It was mockery. I couldn't be me. I was walking on eggshells all of the time in the house, just trying to retain equilibrium, just trying to keep things stable. Watching my kids look at me, there would be an argument. There was one argument about money, about this whole budget thing. And I had proof that he had held back $5,000 in like three months from our family account. And I had proof. And he engaged my son in the conversation and got my son to say, like, of course, my son's like, mom, dad wouldn't steal from us. What? Why would you say that, mom? Why would you say that? Now, you know, I mean, I'm one of the lucky people that somehow or another, you know, why didn't I leave him sooner? I think I think I think if I left him sooner, he would have been able to take my children totally away from me. I think because they were older and I had a strong connection to them that even though they may think I, they may have thought I was crazy or too sensitive or dramatic or all of these things that he had led them to believe I had a foundation, and this is what I always talk about, is that our kids always have some connection to us if we've been a protective parent to them. So so in my case, my son now knows what the truth is, and he clearly sees the manipulation and the gaslighting. But asking a, you know, a 15-year-old, you know, why his father didn't contribute $5,000 towards the family— of course, he's going to believe his father doesn't lie. Why would his mother accuse his father of something so horrible? So that's what he did all the time is it would be just how, who can I get involved in? Like, say he and I had an, I remember one time we had an argument and um, because a lot of the arguments were about his counter parent, parenting, in particular, my daughter, who was more of a kid who um, was, you know, more of the wanting to go to the, you know, party or go to the boy's house without the parents being like, she would just like want to do that. And, and one time he brought my daughter and we had already talked about it, that she wasn't allowed to go to that boy's house again. He could come to our house. And I came home from a run. And when I came home and by the way, I wasn't able to run for years. And then I started running again because running, I was obsessed with running. That was my, I wasn't allowed to run because you're obsessed with running. But then I started again, when I was pulling away, no, I'm going to start running regularly. And, um, he never came to any of my races, by the way. I, I did a lot of like half marathons. He never came to them and rooted me on. Um, but he, he, I came home and my daughter wasn't home and he had taken her to that boy's house. So this is an example of like the counter parenting that goes on. And so I do remember that day pushing him. I pushed him. I was like, what the heck? Like, I didn't say what the heck. Right. And, um, and just feeling so violated. And, but then if your child comes in and knows you just pushed your father, right? And like, they don't understand the context. I'm not suggesting that I should be like, that that was right of me to do, but I think it's called defensive. We call it in the world, like it's a defensive reaction to being over and over again, minimized, controlled, diminished as a parent over and over again, he, she was participating and making fun of me because that's what she learned from him. And so she didn't know how to love me. And that's not her fault. He did that all along. He's employed every abuse tactic, like of the big abuse tactics. Uh, I, yeah. He's triangulated you. He's gaslit you. He's running these smear campaigns, sowing the seeds of doubt in everyone. Mm -hmm. behind the scenes who knows what he's doing to everyone's self-esteem uh everything going on there within the power and control wheel in these last years as things start to ramp up um 
just kind of getting really out of hand as it's as it's going uh, on. It's it's just a snowball picking up steam. Are there things on that wheel that start to get uh, even scarier for you in this time? Yeah. So I would say that I knew that he always knew where I was and I couldn't figure out how. So I went out somewhere and I was at a restaurant and then I got home and he said I was supposed to be, I was at work, but my girlfriend and I decided to go out after work. And this is again, another example of my own, like my work, I had great, I've always had felt really positive about what I do, great self-worth. I have friends at work. I wasn't isolated like people think of isolation. Um, So, so I, so I went out after work with this friend and he said, you didn't tell me you were going out. You told me you were going to work. And his friend saw you at such and such restaurant. And I said, I didn't. And he said, well, she saw you. And I said, well, why didn't she say hello to me? And that was one of the first times, but that I realized he was stalking. Like I had this feeling and it was, I had felt it before, but I had never really wanted to believe it. And that time I said, whoa, there's, and then I started to categorize, like I started to look through my Rolodex, my imaginary Rolodex of all the times he knew where I was. And how did he know every time where I was? The end result when I finally left him was that I knew that he had at least access to my computer, my phone, um, and he had um, a tracking system on my car for five years. So uh, you're going through this five-year period. Everything is, um, you know, going downhill, but eventually you're going to get to a point where it's the beginning of the end. Um, So what, I guess, is the straw or the beginning of the straw that broke the camel's back. Like, did you start, did the therapists point out something to you? Like, when does your like light bulb go on and be like, okay, this is what I'm dealing with. And how does everything kind of domino effect maybe after that? So there's a couple of things. I did leave and go up to the upstairs spare bedroom several times. He always begged me to come back, but it was like this intermittent begging me now, but also really angry if I didn't. And so that I think helped, right? It wasn't just, you know, I love you, please come back. It was, and then be nice. It was, I love you or I hate you. It was like that black and white thinking. Um, There also was the acceleration of my daughter. I could tell being further and further um, split from me. And I knew my son was, but he had gone off to college and it was a little bit different. And I just would visit him on my own separately and take him to lunch and try to, again, create as much connection as possible. But I could not make headway with my daughter. And I was devastated. And so what I realized is if I stay, I'm going to lose her entirely. If I leave, I might lose her. So I decided to leave. And I think, um, I think another thing, there were so many things, honestly, I teach on the power and control wheel every single semester for the last 20 years in my social work classes, every single semester, one semester, I can remember the exact classroom I was in. And I'm talking about this idea of like emotional and counter parenting. It was the counter parenting word that really all of a sudden connected for me that this is what he does for me, does to me all of the time. In the meantime, I found a great therapist who wasn't afraid of being sued. And she gave me John Gottman's book, which is the character, the seven characteristics of a highly effective marriage. And it's really about partnerships. And she said, I want you to read this because I think it's going to help you see that your marriage isn't these things. So she was the first person to say he's abusive. And, um, and there's just so many other things, but what I would say is when I left for the last time, so I went up to the spare room, he begged for me to come down and then, and then it it just, it just, there, it just wasn't working. I could see this counter, it was really about my daughter and I could see all this counter parenting happening. And when I went back upstairs the next time, the emails started. And he started sending me 3,000, well, over a 13-month period, Brandon, I got 3,000 harassing, threatening emails. I would say 300 a month or so. 
And I would say that out of all of them, um, about 10 a month where I love you, you're my soulmate. How could you do this to us and our family? I, I wish that you would reconsider. I can't believe you're leaving me. And then the other 200 and some odd would be you are unlovable. No one will ever love you. Your children will know who you really are. I will show the world who you really are. You're a fake. You're a farce. The maniac that I know. He, um, And so at that point, I think my clinical hat. So remember, I'm a therapist. I've been doing this work my whole life. I've worked in child protective services with domestic abuse. For something for me, when those emails started, they clicked in that I realized that I didn't have to respond. And I think that was my saving grace because had I responded, I mean, he was already sending me upwards of two or 300 a month. If I had responded, he would have sent me 500 a month. And so I would go upstairs and worry about my safety in the upstairs bedroom. I was sleeping on an arrow bed. I couldn't close the door because we had a family cat that always would want to come in. And I would go to sleep in there. I, I would pretend I was going to sleep in there, but then I would leave that room and go to my son's bed because if he knew I was in my son's bed, he would make extra room in the kitchen in the morning, an extra noise in the kitchen in the morning. And if he knew I was in the other room, he would turn the laundry on in the morning. I mean, it was just anything to punish. I wasn't allowed to use the, I, I stayed there for a year in that upstairs room. And I was not allowed to use the garage the whole year. Now, if that doesn't say my own like subjugated position, are you kidding me? The man wouldn't let me use our family garage. I just felt trapped. I didn't know what to do. Like, do I stay? Because my daughter's here. She's 17. She's not even in high school. If I stay, I leave. If I leave, I leave her with him. I mean, how do I leave my child with him? But oh my gosh, she is really like having such great challenges because of the indoctrination that he has done. What do I do? Do I stay in that upstairs room? Do I, I, I you know, there was just, and, and then I knew he had me tracked. I mean, I mean, he literally showed up at my car and took a picture of it and sent it to my daughter. It was at a commuter lot and said, where is your mother? And that for my kids affirmed that he knew, because I parked in a commuter lot we never use. My kids are like, how does he know the car is there? And I said, because he has it tracked. And that for them, so what I always like, and I know this is about my story, but what I always say to our, our my clients is we can't keep gaslighting our children either. We have to let them know the truth because that's the only way they're going to actually begin to see the abuse for what it is. And so... Yeah. So that was a moment. And then I moved, I moved, um, I was, I moved, um, I was going between a girlfriend's on weekends when he was home. And during the week I was staying at the house to get my daughter back and forth to school to be there for her. And then eventually I just got an apartment and I just said, I have to leave. And that's um, in between then I should mention there was um, a time where he threw all of my clothes outside the police came. They told me to leave. And then he um, put the clothes, the police officer helped me put the clothes, all of my personal belongings. He put, he created an altar. All right. He created an altar. And so he thought, um, so he went away on a trip for his school. And while he was away, I had a cocktail with an old high school friend, a drink. Everything was in Facebook Messenger. And I didn't know he had access to my Facebook messenger, but I had nothing to hide. I said, you know, I'm happy to go out for a drink with you, but just as friends, I'm married, you know, and I did say my husband cheated on me. I would never cheat on him. I just would never be able to do that. No problem. We'll just go out and get a drink. He, um, he came home from his trip. He supposedly went on Facebook to look up pictures of the trip. He saw my messages and he left me a voicemail at work. Um, you whore, I'm going to slit your throat. I went immediately to the police because my brother insisted that I did do that. I went to the police and um, they came up to the house. And in the meantime, all of my items were thrown out in the yard. 
And then there was this altar in my closet and it was all candles, my jewelry. It was um, some uh, negligees. It was um, this guy that I went um, went for the drink with. He plays drums. It was cymbals and it was with big notes. I love you. I love you all over the symbols. And and there was, again, in my closet, no clothes. So imagine your walk-in closet is totally empty, but then there's this altar made out of your jewelry boxes with all of these things right there. Um, so yeah, I forgot about that. I didn't forget about it, but I forgot about it. <laughs> um, and so then the police helped me put my things back in the house They told me to leave, which is what the police end up telling victims to leave instead of the abuser, right? So I left with my kids and, um, and that's when I really shared with my son in particular, some of the unhealthy behaviors. He didn't disclose to me that his father had been talking badly about me at all. I didn't find that out for another until I left, um, like five years later. So, um, I would say that I went back home the next day to get some things and my clothes were back outside. He thought he was above the law. The police said to him, do not put those things outside. And he wrote back to the police officer in an email that CC'd me, I'm spring cleaning. That's what he said. So after all of these events happen, you're, you have your own apartment, you've left. Uh, I guess at this point, you know, divorce proceedings will begin in custody. So what happens here? Yeah. So I would say, I always tell people that the, if he had not been so bad post-separation, he might've convinced me to go back to him. But what happened was um, he was showing up at my apartment uninvited. Um, He was, um, there was no, my daughter was 17 and a half. So custody wasn't an issue, but the legal abuse, we would go to court. He didn't have an attorney. He would change his mind three times during the day. So I was paying for a whole day. He was not paying for the day. I was so filled with anxiety. Um, And then um, he did get arrested for the 3000 harassing emails and he did get arrested for um, hurting my daughter. And uh, I mean, I think, that that kind of helped reel him in a little bit. I think that that's when he realized, because again, he works in a high school. So um, I'm sure there was a little bit of worry about whether or not people would find out what happened. And I think for me, a big moment was when I found out in February of, so I left him in 2017 I finally filed in 2018. Um, This was like I left him, but I was in the upstairs bedroom or at my parents' house or at a friend's house and then moved out into my apartment when things got really bad. And I should say he locked me out of the house. The reason why I ended up getting an apartment is I literally couldn't even go home anymore. He had changed all the locks. And because that's considered a civil issue, right, it's not something the police will get involved with. So he had eight cameras up in the home every time. I mean, all over the place in the home. He had them in the home when my children were there. And um, I decided, um, I filed and the divorce took just about a year, but right before the divorce was final, like in February, before the divorce was final in July, I did find out that he had been with the same woman for over eight years. And, um, And so that was a huge, like of all the bad things, I didn't think that he would that he was still cheating on me all that time. Like, I was like, wow, what a dumbo you are. Like, how could you have not known? Like how could, but the husband reached out to me and told me. Um, So yeah, I would say uh, divorce happened, then COVID happened and kids came home. Now remember my kids are indoctrinated, right? Yeah. So they come home during COVID. They're between our beautiful home that we built. Their bedrooms are there and my small little apartment. And they would come and I would just do my very best to make this a safe place for them, to be really therapeutic 
in supporting them, to not ask a lot of questions about him, even though I was devastated at all that he had done to realize like basically 20, 30 years of, I met him when I was 16. So 35 years of my life were a farce. Um, and so um, he began, he was so angry that they would spend any time with me, any time with me at all. And my son did this thing where he slept here four nights and slept there three nights because I was paying his tuition. He totally, by the way, cut off everything financially in 2017. They were both in college. So I was paying all of their college bills myself. He was not paying anything and he was convincing them that he was paying. I had to finally pull up my computer and show my son, look at these deposits and withdrawals. They're all mom. But my son was convinced his father was contributing. And so, um, so the financial abuse was there for sure. And so his goal, I think, was, and, and his new girlfriend is very rich, which is exactly what most of these people like, right? So um, I think when he, he could not tolerate that they wanted to see me, that they wanted anything to do with me in my tiny apartment, anything at all. And so he began to lock them in the house. He turned the electricity off in the garage so they couldn't leave to visit me. He hid their car keys so they could not visit me. Um, he began calling them horrible names, the same names he would call me because, and I didn't even mention all the name calling that was going on, um, because he could not believe that they would want to see their sociopathic mother. So for them, it became, it became, he, to be honest, I know COVID is a horrible thing, but COVID saved my children saw things clearly because of COVID. Had they not come home for an extended period of time and had to go between my home and the abuser's home, they would have never realized he was truly as, they knew there was something, they knew there was some things, but they would have never, even after my daughter, after he gets arrested for assaulting my daughter, she forgave him as any child would. It was that time that they kept seeing this pattern of him really gaslighting them, manipulating lying over and over again and calling them horrible names and everything he called me is really what he was doing. So it was like with you not being around and there being a little bit of a loss of control in, in that aspect of things, you not being around anymore, your ex needed to take out the brunt of abuse on someone and he did it to both of your kids. Mm -hmm. They became his scapegoats, right? I mean, they were his golden children and she in particular was his golden child. He was more lost in that he was easy. He was always doing homework. So he was able to escape more, but she was totally the golden child. And then they both became scapegoats. Yeah. So, now that they are able to see what happened and it's clear as day to them, two questions. One, how do you three heal together? And then for yourself, 35 years, how do you mentally wrap your head around that? To be with someone who is so not the person you started to date originally is very hard to deal with. You've been conned um, and it is painful. So like, where do you begin to heal and understand and process that? Because that is grief. That is beyond grief because, you know, you're still here. That person's still there. You're seeing your life with these kids still. So how do you kind of move forward? Um, understandably, you're going to have days where you're moving backward still. It's going to take a long time. So that's a lot of questions. And so um, I guess start w with the kids and you. So I would say that the reason why I stayed in this relationship and the reason why a lot of victims stay is because we're super optimistic. We're hopeful. We always want to see the best in people. We tend to be accommodating and 
you know, all of those qualities, I think are what has helped me to heal in that I try, like, if I, if I go down the rabbit hole of how, how much of my life was lost on this man, I mean, that's, that's hard to recover from. I think we were married just about 28 years. For me, it kind of goes back to like finding meaning, you know, like there's the whole five stages of grief. And now there's this sixth stage that David Kessler came up with, uh, with Elizabeth Kubler's Ross's um, help in her death. Um, But, you know, like, what is the meaning? Listen, I've been a domestic abuse sexual assault counselor since the age of 19. I've worked in this field my entire life. I have always been a social justice advocate. It just so happens, it's pivoted a little bit now, that now I'm really trying to educate on this term of course of control and on the experiences of children. And, you know, I know I come from a place where I do have an amazing relationship with my children now. And they see it clearly. And I'm so lucky. I'm so blessed because of that. So how do we all heal? Well, his goal was to split since literally the ages of nine and 10, unbeknownst to me. Believe me, there are so many stories I can tell of his examples of doing this that are just heartbreaking. Um, so, and there's so much triangulation. So how do, so my goal as mom was to get them to see me as safe that I'm not cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, right? (laughs) That I am, you know, like I have their back and that I love them, by the way, unconditionally, because these abusers do not know how to love unconditionally. So regardless of who I expected my daughter or my son to be, they're different because of their abuse. They're different, just like I am. And it's love implicit and unconditional, right? So that's number one. And with that, then... And in tandem with that is this idea that I really do really hard, rigorous work at repairing their relationships with each other. That's been, that's been the second phase of trying to heal is trying to really um, engage them both in this idea that they can trust each other, that the things that they were told for many years are not true. Um, And it's hard when they don't live together, right? So I try to create as many positive memories with the two of them together as I can. Um, You know, just sending adorable pictures of the two of them having fun in the backyard when they were kids. It's little things like that. So it's about repairing slowly but surely what he broke apart. And, um, and it's about laughing sometimes about like, you know, he'll send something. So my daughter has him completely blocked, but my son doesn't. And my son says the reason why he doesn't is because it actually, so remember my son is a little more like me. And he says, getting those texts reminds him of how unstable the situation is. It's like, a, it, it's almost, he doesn't want to have cognitive dissonance. He doesn't want to gaslight himself. So seeing that helps him to get clarity even though it might be painful sometimes. And so, but we'll laugh sometimes about some, I mean, my ex wrote a song, gave it to my son. He's a musician. So he wrote a song, but it's in my son's voice. So it's like, pretend that my son wrote the song and it's all about how much my son loves his father and how much he's just like his father. And it's, it's like, it's a beautiful song. I mean, it's, it's poetic. It's everything. But you can't wrap your head around the fact that, like, do you realize what you just did? Do you even realize how pathological that is? You wrote a song in your son's words about how much he loves you. Um, So we can we can have funny moments like that and laugh and make it a little lighter. It doesn't have to be, oh, he's so ill or unstable. We can. Yeah. And positive memories. What I tell all of people that I work with, protective moms in particular, is it's this idea of just really creating as many positive memories as you can. Try to make days as light as possible. Your kids have become so dysregulated by the circumstances. You have to be calm. That's hard. That's hard for me when I tend to chatter fast and be busy. I had to learn to be more calm and safe for them to really believe that I'm safe. And outside of the family, which is most important to you? How about you as your own person 
as far as what makes you happy and what makes you laugh without them being there and how do you, I guess, regulate yourself and your system and get back to a non-CPTSD brain um, in that manner as far as uh, your body and just aligning yourself back to trying to get back to zero or foundation? Yeah, I would say that with the work that I do, it's been very difficult to do that because I'm, um, I'm very busy doing this work, but I'm trying to create some clearer boundaries and, um, I love tennis and I do like running and I do love socializing with friends and I do love dancing, even if it's not the greatest dancing, (laughs) but I do, you know, so I'm a social person and I like to hang out with people. So several times a week, I'll be at a girlfriend's or I'll have a couple of friends here and just hang out. And even if it's just for an hour or play cards or scrabble, yeah, those are the kinds of things I really like to do. And, and those I would say are things that our children need to see us doing too, right? Your point is very well taken. It's not We have to be healthier and whole, separate from them, even if they're not healthy, right? I mean, even if they're not healthy, we have to be so that we're ready when they're ready for us. And we role model for them that they have to do self-care. Yeah, and I'm I'm a big proponent of when, uh, in an early episode we had, if anyone wants to go back and listen, it's like a real early episode. We had this person on named Louise and her her husband she was in a relationship pretty close to the same same as yours and her her kids thought she was incapable thought she was all of these things that they were told and her only response was well the only way to show them that i'm not is to prove them wrong Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. she created her whole new life and at a certain point the kids finally had to say, she didn't tell them, hey, I'm not this. Hey, I'm not. Hey, I'm not that. They just one day came over and were like, hold on one second. Our, our dad has to be lying because you went to school. You got this. You started a business. You became successful in this business and, you know, everything that was there, you're taking care of yourself and all these things. You're not this thing that our dad told you. So I'm, I'm really big into if you're able to like not, you know, action speak, speak louder than words in all those cases. Thank Um, you. So I guess we're at the point here of your story in the show where I always ask, what are the words of wisdom that you might have for everyone uh, listening today? I would say that as women in general, but maybe as humans in general, we're always taught to not follow our intuition. We're, we're kind of told to squash it. Like, you know, you know, you're in the ramp garage and there's a footsteps behind you. You don't run because you don't want to make the person behind you feel bad, like that you feel unsafe or you get into the elevator with another person, even though it might be uncomfortable. I think it's really important that we begin teaching our children that they that their intuition and those butterflies, however you want to call it, are telling them something and they need to listen. And as, as a part of that is how do we, so I started the story with my most loving, amazing parents in the world. I'm so blessed to still have them. And I have an amazing family. I have three siblings and they're all so supportive. We're all close. I'm lucky. But how, how do we begin teaching children about boundaries so that our kids don't end up in relationships like this. How do we show them, like, where is your line? Where is your line that, no, no one can go past here? And if they do, you know, Maya Angelou talks about it, right? She says, when someone shows you who they really are, believe them. Why are we not, when somebody shows us who they are, believe them 
And it's okay to leave. It's okay to get a divorce. It's okay to do all those things. Now I'm saying that, of course, knowing that some people, when they leave, things get way worse. So caveat it with that. But if you can leave. Well, Mia, thank you for being our guest here today. You know, you, you really did a great job of, uh, of telling your story and educating people at the same time today. So it's just a really big thank you. And, you know, everyone out here is um, happy you're out and that um, you do have, even though you might not think so, you do have a lot of life left and um, to do amazing things and to be with your family and to enjoy them in every way in the, in the next part of their lives and to be proud of them and and them proud of you. Um, and you do a lot of great work in this world. So from everyone, uh, I just want to say like, really, thank you so much for being here with us and for doing what you do. Thank you so much, Brandon, for what you do. So I can't tell you everywhere I go, Brandon Chadwick. Oh my gosh. He is like, you are doing so much good in the world. And, um, you know, I mean, I think, isn't that if we could just make a little difference, right? Just a little tiny difference. I think we've done our job. (laughs) Well, thank you very much once again, Mia, for being here and sharing your story. And if you want to share your story like Mia did today, please do go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there is a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. Please read all of the instructions on our Guest Form page and then either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send us your email or your Submit Form information in the format that we ask for. And once again, we can never have enough stories. So please do send in your stories. Also, if you have not left us a review on whatever service you use, it helps out the show a lot when it comes to rankings and for people to uh, see um, our show and to hear about it. And uh, reading wonderful reviews helps people click on it. And that helps a lot more people in the long run. So please do review our show and give us some five star ratings if you can. And if you're someone out there that needs support, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. There is a support group button at the top of the page. And when you click on that button, it takes you to our very own safe social network. And on the network, we have three Zoom meetings a week, Wednesday nights, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. It's a great meeting. It's pure support group. Uh, Everyone in our group is fantastic, and they are there to support you. We also have forum boards where you can be supported as well by the people in our group. And we have episodes that never made it to air. And we have ad-free episodes on there as well. We will be revamping how the whole entire thing works by January. I think it should be starting. We're in the process of that right now to make it really like really cohesive and, and interactive throughout the every single day of the week. Uh, that will be coming up in January when we get that rolling. And if you need even more support than we already give you right now, there's an organization called domesticshelters.org. It's a fantastic organization. It's a website. Go there. They have articles and resources that, to help you make sense of what you're going through. There are phone numbers and shelter uh, numbers and web websites on that site every shelter every every domestic violence agency is on there all of the phone numbers and, and and the websites for them if you need that type of help domesticshelters.org is a, an amazing organization so please do go visit them today it is a free resource and i think that's it for today so for myself and mia we hope you have a good night <laughs>